out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment your needs to supply. Reach out. This morning, let's take our Bibles and turn in the New Testament to the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18, Powerful Ministers. We're going to look at two very powerful ministers today, Paul and Apollos. We're going to see them demonstrate the power of God in their ministries, a power which was available not only for them, but also for you and for me, power for all who will call upon the name of the Lord. Honey, lead us before the powerful throne of God, would you please? Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you for this opportunity to study your word. We ask that you bless us now as we read and study your whole word. And please prepare the hearts of those who are listening and those who will listen in the future. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. As you and I go forth to serve the Lord, we have not only his authority, but also his power, his ability to share the word and to demonstrate the confirming signs for that word. It all comes from the Gospel of Mark, as Jesus makes a promise to those disciples there on that occasion, the 10 who were gathering on that night, but also for you and for me as well. Mark 16, beginning in verse 15, the words of Jesus. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. And so it came about that as the Lord gave that command, they obeyed. Verse 19. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. So we're not only to share the word of salvation through Jesus Christ, but demonstrate that through the power of the Holy Spirit, not only in healings and uh, demonic deliverances, speaking with tongues and being uh, held harmless from attacks on us, but also just the power to share the word and the power to live the word daily. And they did it, and it's available for us. Those were the words of the Lord on the resurrection night. And then according to the book of Acts, chapter 1, just before he was ascended, he made this promise again about the power that is available to us as believers. He said in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You're going to receive power. Greek word is dunamis. What word do we get from that in English? We get dynamite, dynamic, right? And we think about the power to heal or raise the dead or cast out demons, as we mentioned, but also it's the power to witness, to share, not just the the boldness to speak, but the credibility behind it. You've got to have the credibility. You've got to have a lifestyle that's going to bear witness to it. Not perfection, but sincerity and the willingness to go in the right direction. There's an old saying, I can't hear what you say because who you are screams so loudly in my ears. And so we don't want phonies. We don't want hypocrites. We don't want to be like that. We want to be sincere. Lord, help me to be sincere as a witness for you. Well, Paul is on his second missionary journey and people are coming to Christ. He's getting a lot of resistance from the Jews, but some Jews are coming to the Lord, and uh, Gentiles are coming in great numbers, and we're gonna see that power. The idea of power is, again, for us as well. Powerful 
minister. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're a powerful minister in Christ. Go right ahead and say that. You're a powerful minister in Christ. You didn't say it to me. You're a powerful, powerful <laughs> minister in Christ. Well, yeah, it's better. I didn't know you meant me. Yes, that's right. You're all powerful ministers in Christ. The power is there. The power is there. Are you going to use it? That's the important thing. All right, let's look at uh, uh, Paul. He's in Corinth at the island of Greece. He's in the southern part of Greece. He was in Athens in the last chapter. And in Athens, where they were so sophisticated and so philosophical uh, that uh, they, they listened to him and they said, eh, we'll hear this again some other time. They were very open to hearing, but not open to receiving. And so he just kept on going. Sometimes you hit a home run, sometimes you strike out, but you keep on going. So in chapter 18, he's in the southern part of Greece, known as Corinth. And here we're going to see him uh, testify. He's going to get mixed results in the first eight verses. And then the Lord is going to encourage him uh, in verses 9 to 17. So let's pick it up with chapter 18 and verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. But when they <laughs> And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, who, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing believed, and were baptized. So we'll stop there for a minute and see what's going on. Uh, compared to the laissez-faire, I don't really care attitude of the Athenians, he's getting a better response in Corinth, isn't he? And so he said, uh, by that he's encouraged. But let's look now, let's go back to um, verse 1. He uh, has left Athens, he's come to Corinth, and uh, he's picking up uh, an acquaintance there, a man named Aquila, and uh, Aquila has a wife named Priscilla. They are Jews. They have been subject to being driven out of Rome by the emperor, uh, the Caesar, Claudius, uh, anti-Semitic uh, persecution, and they had to leave. And so they have come now to this area of Corinth, and they are busy working as tent makers. Tent makers uh, would be a very difficult trade, a very smelly trade, uh, because the tents were made of goat hair. And these black uh, and uh, sometimes speckled uh, tents were thick. You had to drive needles through them. They would be smelly. Uh, and you had to have strong arms. It was tough, back-breaking work. And uh, Paul was of the same mind. Paul didn't just simply sit around and talk. He worked. He's also the one who said, if you don't work, you don't eat. There's a good motivation for working, isn't it? Well... They are working together and uh, making tents. And Silas and Timothy have come from Macedonia to join him now. And uh, he's compelled by the Holy Spirit. And he testifies to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. That's the message. Jesus is the Christ. Christos in the Greek, Mashiach in the Hebrew, it means anointed. The one who's anointed, commissioned by God to save. And so he's sharing that message. He's compelled by the Holy Spirit. And I think that's something you and I should be aware of. We're talking about powerful ministers. A powerful minister has to sense the Holy Spirit. You're not going to share Christ with every single person you meet every day. Don't have time. That's right. And it's not the calling of God. You need to know when God is saying go. If you have any question, go ahead anyway. But Make sure that you hear from God. Divine appointments. Absolutely. I shared the story before of my being in Philadelphia, waiting to fly back to Albany many years ago. 
And I got, I was rushing to make the connection and I was running down the, the hallway, got into the area for boarding and they were already boarding for Albany and it was packed. It was the whole place was just packed. And I suddenly looked at this old lady and I was probably about 42 at that time. She was probably the age I am right now. And the Lord said to, her, to my heart, you're to share Christ with her. I thought, are you kidding? I can barely get a seat in this place. And I saw where she sat. She sat up in the second row. And my seat was way back. You know where I was sitting, next to the toilet, right? Always next to the toilet. And so i thinking, well, that's, whew, that's, that's not of God. Place is totally packed. All the seats are filled. It must not be an assignment. I'm going to escape this bullet, right? So I'm sitting there, and the Lord's quiet. Now we're getting ready to descend into Albany, and that stirring comes, led by the Holy Spirit, witness to her. I'm thinking, ah, this is nonsense. There's no seat next to her. And the Lord just said, get up and walk down that aisle. I walked down that aisle. Every seat was taken except the one right next to her. And so I'm thinking, here's a 40-something-year-old guy and a 70-some-odd-year-old gal, and... Uh, She'll think I'm coming on to her or something. Could I sit next to you? She said, by, by all means, please do. And so I sat next to her, and I began to share Christ with her. I said, would you like to be saved? And she said, yes. Said a sinner's prayer. <laughs> as soon as we finished, the young man across the aisle reached his hand out to her and said, may I shake your hand and welcome you into the family of God? And she said, everybody's a Christian at that point. And so, the, the, but you know, I had to pass 50, 60, 70 people before I could go to her. And so be led by the Spirit to be a powerful minister. All right. So he is um, he's getting resistance from the Jews, verse 5, right? Uh, he's, he's sharing Christ, uh, and they're opposing him, verse 6. They're blaspheming. Uh, and he shakes his garment. It's a symbol of that's it. You know, I'm done with you guys. Your blood be upon your own heads. Ezekiel said in the Old Testament, warn them. Warn them. If you do not warn them of the you're doom to come, you're responsible. And so you must. Then their blood is on your hands. You warn them. I think sometimes people, because I'm always warning people, and I, I want to say, I want to put a big heading up on my social media or my friends or wherever I go and say, I'm only obeying the rules. I'm just the messenger. <laughs> I don't even like doing this, to be honest with you. And honestly, I hate it. I really don't like it. You can see how I'm mad I get. But God calls us to do this. Because what I know, I've been given a gift. And I have great insight. I really believe the Lord has given me extreme insight into the, into the Word and all the insight He has. So you have to tell people, right? Because you're responsible. So that's why ministers do what we do. It's not because it's so much fun. Um, it's not really being fun, not liked a lot. It's not fun at all. But we do it because God calls us to do it. Amen? That's right. And we're all ministers and we're all to share it. Uh, my mother used to say when the kids would moan and groan about uh, her discipline, I'm not running a popularity contest. My job here is to raise responsible kids. And so you're not running a popularity contest. Uh, if you're popular with the world because of your faith, something's wrong because the world resists that faith. Well, let's see what's happening here. He's, he's getting resistance now, and he's going to go to the Gentiles, he says. And so verse 7, he departed from there. He entered the house of a man named Justice, one who worshipped God, and his house was next to the synagogue. And look at this now, verse 8. Here's a good result. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with Whoa. all his household. Whoa. Whoa. So here you have the head of the synagogue the rabbi or whatever he was called then, he becomes a believer. What's going to happen to him? You're going to see in a few minutes, they get rid of him in a hurry. <laughs> they get rid of him in a hurry. And so many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. So it looks like a good report, doesn't it? If you judge the work of the Spirit by the results, you're going to sometimes be a bit deceived. A powerful minister does not look at results. A powerful minister looks at the Lord. Jesus. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Many are believing. Many are being baptized. Let's relax. Let's be happy. Hallelujah. Let's party. No, that's for those that like to watch Super Bowl Sunday or something. But for the ministers, when they come to the Lord, you say, praise the Lord, but you keep your eyes on the Lord because you know something? 
As soon as there's a great victory, and I learned this in the army, I learned this in Vietnam, when things were peaceful, when I was over there, that's not so good. Because when it's peaceful, look out. The rockets literally are about to come in. And so here we have good results. Keep your eyes on the Lord. The great preacher in the end of the 1900s, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, did not go to the door to greet people on the way out the way many did. You know what he did after service? And he would preach to 18 to 20,000 people in London with no microphone in those Revival. days. You know what he did at the end of a service? He'd go right back to his office and get on his knees and he would pray. Wow. Because I have found that the <clears throat> devil attacks me wow. mostly on Sundays. After service, Sunday evening when I'm tired, I get discouraged. So great success, look to the Lord. In this case, he didn't have to call on the Lord. The Lord came to him. So things look good, plug in with Jesus because you might need a stronger connection based on what's going to happen next. So now we find that verse 9. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. For I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. All right, now that's a very strange message from the Lord because we've just had a great success. Yes, the Jews have been showing typical resistance, but the Gentiles are coming. Many are being baptized. And the Lord is saying, do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. For I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. That doesn't fit with the preceding verses, but it fits with the following verses. The Lord will speak to you sometimes and give you a warning of what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. That's why you go into God's word, not to affirm how great you are, but to check and see what you need and to get a warning about the future. Don't be afraid. Speak. Don't keep silent. There's going to be resistance. You're going to be afraid. I am with you. And the same applies to us as well. I was a bit afraid to walk down the aisle of that airplane to talk to that lady. Can you imagine her saying, no, you can't sit next to me? Or yes, sit next to me. And are you crazy? I would never accept the Lord. <laughs> or what are you doing, you young whippersnapper? But when God says go, you go. And you do what you're afraid to do sometimes. So, so did you water the flowers? <laughs> I think in that case, I was able to see the little rosebud just pop so out of you, the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, incidentally, when God works, watch how he works in multiple levels. That young man who put his hand across the aisle and said, welcome to the family of God. He and I began to talk as we descended the plane. Turns out he was a pastor's son. Turns out he was from the south and he was going to be landing in Albany and driving to Buffalo. And as we were walking down the aisle, I said, uh, how about coming over to our house for dinner? So I called up mother and said, mom, get dinner on the table. I wasn't married at the time. And we went over to the house and he said, you know what I really want? He said, I've been raised in the church. My father's a Baptist minister, but I've never spoken with tongues. Could you pray with me? I said, I'd be very happy to do that. We laid hands upon him. He spoke with tongues, got in the car, drove to Buffalo, sent me a letter. We didn't have computers in those days. Sent me a letter. A couple of days later saying, all my life, I've loved the Lord. But the joy I have had praying in tongues going out to Buffalo has put me on a new level I have never known in my life. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. So God works. And uh, don't be afraid. You speak. I'm with you, the Lord is saying. So what did Paul do? He hung in there, verse 11. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So he had to hang there another year and a half, 18 months. That's a very long time for Paul to stay in one location. But he did, and he taught the word. And then verse 12, here we go. When Ga Gal Galileo was pro proconsul of Achaia, Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, this fellow <clears throat> persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. 
and he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sothethenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Galileo took no notice of these things. So he taught for about 18 months. And when the Lord says, I'll be with you, don't be afraid, that was to encourage him during those 18 months. But also, it was to get him through this crisis here when uh, Galileo, uh, who was the proconsul, he was the governor, really, of that southern region of Greece, known as Achaia, and uh, they all rose up and they, they brought him before the judgment seat, so it was another opposition, another attack. And that's life. All the so time. Yeah, you know, that's, that's life. You're going to find that there's always going to be a, a negative situation. Uh, we don't like that, but that is life. And so we find here that Paul is, is escaping. He doesn't get beaten on that occasion. This poor fellow, uh, Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, uh, was beaten. So they'd thrown Crispus out because he became a believer. And uh, now they've got Sosthenes and he gets beaten and he's not even a believer. So uh, uh, he's, uh, he's having a tough time there. So this is uh, keeping your eyes on the Lord. That's the key to being a powerful minister. Keep your eyes on Jesus. All right, let's begin now with verse 18. We're going to see that Paul is going to return back home to his a home base in Antioch up in Syria. Let's pick it up with verse 18. So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Sensira, for he had taken a vow. I give her the hard part here. <laughs> I hate all those Greek words. <laughs> and... Uh, I, there's one little clue. Centria? Yes, it's Centria, who knows. Uh, how do you pronounce all these words? Quickly, so that people forget what you <laughs> said. <laughs> I have enjoyed listening to myself play back a tape, and I'll say Centria one time and Kentria the next, and I don't even repeat myself the same way. Who cares? My father used to say, say it, and if they object, say it. In my village, that's how we learn to say it. So uh, in any event, uh, he had his hair cut off. What does that mean? He made a vow. He made a vow, probably the Nazarite vow. You remember how you would, uh, the Nazarite vow was to never cut your hair like mm -hmm. Samson? Uh, in this case, uh, there were also uh, temporary vows, like for a period of time, until you would go to the, to the uh, important feast day, and then you'd cut it off. Uh, we, we've made vows, right? Uh, uh, Catholics and, and others try to do this during uh, Lent. They, they abstain from this or that for a period of time. It's the same kind of an idea. So he has his hair cut. And uh, he takes Priscilla and Aquila with him. So he came to Ephesus, verse 19. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. He doesn't give up. He still continues. Now, the batting average with Jews is not too great. But the Lord still said to him, to the Jew first and then the Gentiles. And of course, the synagogue was always open to visiting teachers, and he was that. And so he was continuing to share don't give up on an ethnic group. Uh, don't give up on a, a certain people of background, uh, whether it's by, by, by a religion or whatever. Just share as the Holy Spirit leads you. You never know when that person's going to come to the Lord. Amen. All right. When and they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent. So here he's in Ephesus. He's now on the uh, western part of Turkey. And uh, he's there and uh, he's doing well. He reasoned with the Jews. And they wanted him to stay a longer time. Now, most of the time, they wanted to throw him out of town. Here, they want to try to keep him around, but he can't because he needs to get back to Jerusalem for the high holy day. And so they took leave of them, verse 21. Saying, I must by, by all means keep this commanding, this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. So he goes to uh, Caesarea, he lands on the, uh, the shore of Israel, and he goes up to Jerusalem to see James and Peter and John, no doubt, and give a report, and then he goes back to his home church in Antioch. After he had spent some time there, he departed and went over the region of Galatia and Phryg Phrygia, in order, strengthening all the disciples. So verse 23 marks the beginning now of the third missionary journey. This man just continues to minister as long as he can. That's what you and I do. That's another evidence of a powerful minister. 
you don't give up. You just keep going. What else are you going to do? What else are you going to do? Exactly. When I was discouraged about ministry in my early days and wanted to leave, my mother used to say, what else are you going to do? And so uh, you just continue with whatever. The, the devil can't stop you. Oh, he may knock you down today. But you get right back up again tomorrow and he can't stop you. And so he just continues and continues and continues. Talk about retirement. There's no harm in retiring from your job. But don't ever retire from serving the Lord. Don't ever retire from sharing Christ with others. You're always going to be doing that. And so he's now starting the third missionary journey. And we're going to see another powerful minister now named Apollos. Beginning with verse 24, honey. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. So here we see a man, and I've done a little bit of word study on what makes this man powerful. When you see somebody who you admire, could be in sports, could be in politics, <laughs> could be uh, in uh, showbiz, could be in business, you study that person. You study that individual. There are lots of books being written, and I like to look at YouTube and Amazon at night and look at history to see uh, what great people did and, and didn't do. And... Uh, we uh, can learn from them. And we look, look at this Bible and say, what makes this Apollos powerful? And let's look at it more closely and examine the Greek words. That'll help us. Uh, verse 24, let's go back to that. And read that again, honey, would you? Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. So suddenly he appears on the scene. He's got a Greek name, Apollos, but he's a Jew and he's born in Africa, uh, in Alexandria. He's an eloquent man. Now the word eloquent, I've given you that in the uh, uh, notes there is logios. We get the word logos for the word. It's somebody who's skilled in the word. It doesn't mean uh, a smooth talker necessarily, uh, although there's part of it. You are eloquent in speech, but you are learned. You, you can't are, be. You're not a dumb person if you're eloquent. If, you, if you're eloquent, you have to know what you're talking about. Um, now there are those who have... Uh, try to improve themselves. Uh, Moses had discounted himself saying, I'm not of good speech. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, so therefore God used his brother to be the spokesperson for Israel. Mm -hmm. But um, I think about Benny Hinn was a person who stuttered when he was young and mm -hmm. he worked to overcome it. I was a terrible stutterer. And the kids used to, I was stutter and fat. How about that for a, for a little of a burden? And folks would say, Jerry, fat boy. Well, it, uh, it helped me to uh, uh, start There was to work a lot of bullying <laughs> back 50, 60 years ago. <laughs> I had the biggest rear end, not to get too personal about that, but uh, <laughs> my mother went to the doctor, and the doctor said, He's 13, he's all rear end. He's going to shoot up and be tall. You'll be rejoicing. <laughs> Any event. Smart. Uh, so, uh, but that's more about me than we need to talk about. But I had to work on that. And I, for me, I went into drama. And uh, uh, I think uh, one of the uh, candidates, uh, Biden, talked about being a stutterer as well. And he worked to, uh, through poetry to overcome it. If you've got a handicap, work on it. You can overcome it. Uh, but here it means he's skilled in speech, but he's also learn it in the word. He knows the Bible and he's rational and he's wise. He's rational and he's wise. He reasons things out and that's important. He's also mighty in the scriptures. Look at that word. It's dunatos. Dunatos is mighty. It means he's powerful, he's strong, he's able. I used to say to the Lord when I was first saved, I listened to radio programs on the local radio stations and this preacher says this and the other one says the opposite. How do I know who's telling the truth? And he said, get into the word yourself and read it cover to cover. And I did it several times and made that a lifelong practice of reading it cover to cover. When you know it yourself, then you know 
who's telling the truth and who's not. And I don't want to be denigrating anybody. But just because someone says it on radio, television, or YouTube, doesn't make it so. Doesn't make it so. One of my favorite teachers would give me the Greek word, like dunatos, and I think I'd listen to him. <laughs> he was way out in left field. One of my other favorite preachers was a very colorful guy. He'd tell a story in the Bible, fantastic. It wasn't true, it wasn't in the word, but it made a good story. Mm -hmm. Get into the word yourself. You ever handle funny money? Play money? Got grandkids with Monopoly? play money? What do they do with tellers in the bank to be able to detect true money versus false money? Handle the real money over and over and over again. When you handle the genuine, you can tell the counterfeit. When you know the word, you can know the counterfeit. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of counterfeit teaching there because some teachers want to sell their ministry more than handle the word of God accurately. And that's very, very sad. In any event, he was mighty. Now look at verse 25. Read that one, honey. Would you? This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he had been instructed in the way of the Lord. He was instructed in what he knew. He understood what he had learned. He had learned all that was available to him. And he was fervent in spirit. And that word fervent, I think, is not really strong enough. The word is zeo in the Greek, and it means to boil with heat. It means to boil. You ever boil an egg? Sure you have. And when you can tell when that water begins to rumble and tumble and roll, it's boiling, right? And that's the way he was. He was hot. He was zealous for the good of the Lord. He was fervent in spirit. You cannot be powerful as a minister unless you are on fire for the Lord. You have to have passion. You have to have passion. We used to pray for the sick after service with my mother, and we'd get a group of five or six people there, and she'd say, all right, who has the hot hand? She meant who is fervent in the Holy Spirit. Not just someone who's going to speak, oh, Lord, we ask you to touch and to heal, Isaiah 53, blah, blah, blah. Who really has the belief? Who really has the hot hand? You know, I just heard uh, someone, a preacher, it wasn't a preacher, but someone who's, who's like a preacher, he does healing um, with this ministry, and he gave an example. There was a woman, I thought it was very interesting. I don't know when it happened, but he said that there was someone who couldn't walk, and I don't know what the injury was, but it was pretty bad, and the person told what was going on, the congregation listened, and then they were going to pray for healing for her. And he said he felt in his spirit to ask people if anyone believed um, that she could, if whoever did, who did not believe would, would raise their hand. He said half the people raised their hands. So he said, um, I'm going to ask you to leave because I really, I need only people who believe. And um, the woman was healed. So I, I was thinking a lot about that, and I thought, wow, that's really important. That's why we have to be careful who prays for us and who we're, we're praying. Are we... That's a whole other... Right? Am I right? That's right. Be careful. When my father was 49 years of age, he, <clears throat> he had a massive heart attack. So bad that his closest friend, a medical doctor, Harold Bellin, came over to his house. Dad did not want to go to the hospital. Harold Bellin said, doesn't make any difference. You're never going to make it anyway. You just, it's too, uh, you're too far gone. And we began to pray. We did not go to the hospital. We were trusting in the Lord for divine healing. And mother threw everybody out of the house or the presence who did not have a fervent spirit for healing, including me. Threw me out of the house. Said, go stay with your sister. She's got an apartment over next to Albany. Nothing Mass. like a mother bear. You know that, right? Get out of here. We don't want your unbelief here. You're stinking thinking. Get out. So it was my mother... There was a nurse, she said, you go downstairs and watch television. Your faith is not strong enough. And only my mother and my brother could stay with him. And they prayed, and all that night long. And the next morning, he was healed. It was the most amazing healing. And it was also Easter morning, too, a new resurrection beginning. But you need to have a strong, fervent heat. And uh, God sometimes will symbolically use that in certain people. My mother had it in her hand. Her right hand would begin to get hot and she'd get an electricity in it, and when she'd lay hands on somebody, that person was healed. Now, I never had that electricity or that hot hand, but 
My mother died, and I thought, gee, I'm alone without any hot hands, so I think I'll marry one. And my wife has both hands that get, get hot. Sometimes. They don't, they get, um, today when I was praying this a little while ago, when we first came in, I got weak in the knees. I never, that never happens. So when I asked the Holy Spirit, I felt it. But usually I feel like electricity in my fingers. Not all the time. It depends, you know, depends. But it doesn't mean you have to have that. That's just something that's manifested to her. And uh, yep. the, the, the important thing is to be hot. Hot for the Lord. Be passionate. If you want to be good in anything, you've got to be hot about it. And you have, to, you have to stay at it. You know, there's people who have chronic illness, right? And they take their meds. That doesn't mean we tell you to take, stop taking your medications. We tell you to be faithful in what you're supposed to do. And as there may be a time that God says you can stop or you can pull back. You've got to really be... This is not a quick fix. It's not today. Sometimes it is. Sometimes you're instantly healed. But sometimes we're dealing with chronic illness. Sometimes iniquities involved in that. Generational curses. That there's so much. You really got to get in and really work it. Work your healing, and it takes sometimes time. But the people are delivered and healed. That's right. And that faith comes by healing and healing by the Word of God. We have on our website. If you want to go to it, reachoutfellowship.com, and go to teachings. Go to Jerry's teachings, and you'll see. Uh, a whole page on healing. Uh, for those who are here, we have a booklet called 31 Days of Healing. I've written this every day. There's a prayer and a scripture for your healing. We've got all sorts of resources. We have uh, a lot of goodies. It's all free. We don't make any money off of this stuff. You know, when I got, came, married Jerry after being a nurse, and it was a few more years before the Lord really got a hold of me, I had heard about the healing message years ago because I did go to a church that believed in the healing message and I went to two churches that didn't. They would pray, but they didn't believe like this. And then after becoming a nurse and then Mary and Jerry, it took a few years before it really got into me. And most people know how it got into me, but that doesn't matter. It, I learned I had to take being a nurse and take the healing message. And how does that come together? I see now that the Lord called me. That was in a, it was in a uke unique position for me. Not everybody has that. Um, so as I go and minister as a nurse, I certainly don't go and say, don't take your medication. You know, I, but actually what the Lord does is oftentimes I'll be at a bedside and I've had this happen. He knows it. Um, that all of a sudden the Lord will just, I'll just feel the Holy Spirit, what the problem is. And, and I've actually, but I use that knowledge and then the Holy Spirit and it brings it together. Um, and, you know, obviously I, do it in a way that I'm supposed to do it through nursing and advocate. Um, but God is good. And it, that was a struggle for me because I couldn't understand how God could heal with medication. But we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Amen. And being a nurse, she knows the particular parts of the body much better than I do. And I uh, Zandra has the same Zandra, thing. Zandra, it's good to hear a doctor and a nurse pray because they know specifically, instead of a shotgun approach, Lord heal, they can go right with a laser beam on what the situation is and speak to that particular malady. We believe in science, but we believe in Here's the Lord. There's another book that we wrote called God's Medicine Cabinet with selected scriptures on healing. And then I went through one uh, time to get every healing Amazing. scripture from Genesis to Revelation I could find. Healing for... Scriptures for Healing Parts 1 and 2, these are all available in the back. And uh, you got to have to get in the Word of God, get into it every single day until you get it from your head into your heart. You have That's to work it, it work That's it, right. work it. Work it indeed. One more thing about our friend uh, Apollos in verse 25. He uh, spoke and taught accurately the things of the Word. Accurately is the word akiro, I'm sorry, akribos, and it means exactly, diligently, and perfectly. I wish that was the situation with teachers today. For the most part, I'm sorry, I find the most uh, preachers, as far as accuracy, the low percentage of accuracy on scriptures. Pre teachers, a little bit higher, but still not uh, the way it should be. Being a lawyer, I was disciplined. You don't mess around with judges, and you have to be exact when you interpret the law. And so I've learned from the scriptures, give it exactly, because God's word will stand on its own. You don't need to put a little top spin on it, make it what you wish it said. Just give it accurately and let the word do its work. He was accurate in the word, and the last quality about him I want to mention here is he was bold. He spoke that word boldly. He began to speak boldly, verse 26, in the synagogue. And that word boldly, it's a tough word. It's parisia zomai, and it means freely, confidently, and with assurance. When you've been sent by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to bring a message, you can and should be confident, 
free and assured Amen. in what you're saying. It's the greatest message the world has ever known. And so this is the quality of this man, and boy, he had good success. Um, but now notice this, he, was, he had all those qualities, but he still had some things to learn. He had not the full situation here. Let's read the verse 27. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. So again, he's bold, he's uh, vigorous, and he is uh, engaging in arguments. He has a strong, strong countenance. But there's something about him which uh, was very, very interesting. <clears throat> he was... Um, he didn't have the complete picture. Let's read verse 26. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard them, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. He uh, only had, um, it goes on to say, he had the, only the knowledge of the baptism of John. What does that mean? What was John's message? John the Baptist was saying what? Repent. Repent. The Messiah is coming. That was his message. That's all Apollos knew. There was more. Jesus did come. Jesus did die. Jesus did uh, become raised from the dead. He didn't know all of that. And so, quietly and modestly, without embarrassing him, Aquila and Priscilla called him aside and said, Apollos, there's more. Remember that fellow on the plane who said to the lady, welcome to the family of God? A pastor's son. All his life he had known the word. He was humble enough to say, there's more. I want tongues. I want the baptism in the Holy yeah, Spirit. Yeah, wow. Are we humble enough to say there's more that I could learn? Yes. Or I know it all? Oh. oh, no, no. So he was humble enough to be called aside by this husband and wife and to be given the full message. And then he went right back into full gear and boldly shared it and refuted it and continued on. That's the idea of a powerful minister. So Paul and Apollos... Uh, had power, that power is available to you and to me today, but that power is only through Jesus Christ. And honey, let's uh, share the good news of salvation. Sure. For those who don't know the Lord, Kelly's going to share with you, perhaps you're watching by uh, television, YouTube, what have you, and uh, you're not sure you know Christ, or maybe you're backslidden and want to get back into that relationship with him. You want that power once again. Well, that power is available, but you have to have Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, yesterday I was, um, had my grandchildren for a while, and so I was playing some music for them. And um, one of our people here, uh, Kelly, had given me a, a CD quite a long time ago, an old CD from like 30 years ago. Um, and it has a lot of the old kid Christian songs, so I have that. And my, ki my grandchildren love it. Um, years ago, when my kids were growing up, I used to play all those songs. And I didn't quite, I mean, I always loved them and sang them with them and did little things. Well, as I was listening to them yesterday, now this sounds crazy at my ripe old age, that all of a sudden I felt the Lord speaking to me about these songs. One of the songs, When the Sheaves Come In. Remember that song? And I was thinking to myself, so I felt the Lord saying to me, this is why it's so important, children, for children, to hear these songs. We're laying a, laying a foundation on all these songs. These are the word of God. These are scriptures. And, they're, and now I understand all those songs so clearly. The kids play them. But, you know, take those songs. Get old Christian songs. Get those, those, those songs. They're so important. It's the pure word of God. And so the Lord was showing me that this is so important to give to children as small as they are, I've got to spread that message. So for whoever who is hearing them, you're going to pour the word of God into your, your children, your grandchildren, and one day that's going to come back to them. They're going to understand it, and it's going to grow. And that's what we do with salvation. When we first get saved, we don't really know what happened. We just know we ask Jesus into our heart. Some people have a, a revelation. Some people have a great you know, I had a couple months, I remember six months, I was flying high, and then, you know, reality came, <laughs> and then I got persecuted, and I realized that I couldn't sin, and I wanted to, and that was a whole lifestyle of, of uh, learning to change. So, you know, 
but this is why we get saved. It's, it's a beginning. It's all the beginning. We're laying a foundation. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord, Romans 6.23. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. And then after we admit we're a sinner, we confess, we believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again as the payment for our sins. For the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life, John three sixteen. Confess Jesus publicly. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 9 to 10. And so now I'm going to say this prayer, and this is for anyone who has never accepted Christ. If you would like to accept Jesus Christ into your heart, you have to admit, first of all, that you're a sinner. You have to turn, repent from your sins, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, ask him into your life, and ask him to live his life in you. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, I admit that I am a sinner. I admit that I am a sinner. And I repent of my sins. And I repent of my sins. I believe Jesus Christ died for my sins. I believe Jesus Christ died for my sins. He was raised from the dead. He was raised from the dead. As payment for those sins. As payment for those sins. I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord, for my new spiritual life. Thank you, Lord, for my new spiritual life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. And if you prayed that for the very first time, welcome to the family of God. Amen. And may the Lord lead you to a church in your area that's faithfully teaching his word. And may you be faithful to be a blessing to them, and they in turn a blessing to you as that, well. That is the greatest thing you could ever do. That is something that we have to do more often. We try, we try to do it every service. The greatest thing you'll ever do is accept the, the Lord Jesus Christ into your life. Amen. Amen. Our radio program always has a sinner's prayer at the end as well. And over the years, many folks have contacted me uh, in this ministry and said, I prayed that prayer with you. I pulled the car over on the side of the road, and I prayed that prayer, and I've been saved now for X number of years, and thank you so much. Just getting the word on out. Well, our closing hymn is of the same idea. Uh, it's, a, it's a hymn that uh, really shares this idea of sharing the good news with others and the power of Jesus Christ with others. It's called Freely, Freely. <laughs> Amen. 
freely, freely, in the name of Jesus. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day in the Lord. moment your needs to supply. Reach out and touch the Lord as He